Okay, so in the second half of our uh, course here, we're going to talk about uh, autoimmune and degenerative disorders. Um, this is a course on rapidly progressive dementia, and I'm pleased to tell you about autoimmune encephalopathies because this is a rapidly progressive uh, field of neurology uh, and very exciting. Because as we're looking at patients who present with these rapidly progressive dementias, you've heard about uh, CJD, which is always uh, a concern and high in the differential diagnosis, and uh, as of right now, of course, we have no treatment for that. So we definitely want to make sure we don't miss treatable infections or treatable autoimmune forms of encephalopathy. Uh, so my disclosures are there. Uh, this is going to be um, a, sort of a case-based discussion, so we'll, we'll start with a case. So our first case is a 59-year-old lady who has a significant smoking history, and she presents uh, with a complaint of burning uh, and numbness in the feet and the hands, and then over a few weeks, in a rapidly progressive sort of way, develops behavioral and cognitive changes. And so in particular, there's this personality change. She becomes, uh, formerly her family uh, described her as a very intense and um, inflexible person, and she became more pleasant and pliable, so they weren't too unhappy about that. But she also had increased memory loss, couldn't remember names or directions, uh, but her remote memory was intact. She also lost her sense of taste and smell, and in particular lost her interest in smoking, which was unusual. She was losing weight. Uh, and all of that was going on, uh, and, and then she had a seizure, which got their attention, and they brought her in for evaluation. So on her examination, she had a marked short-term memory deficit, but also had areflexia and some uh, asymmetric proprioceptive sensory loss. So um, additional evaluation. So CSF, as you heard, is an important evaluation for folks with rapidly progressive uh, dementia. And she had a mildly elevated protein and, and a mild lymphocytic pleocytosis not as exciting as you've seen in some of the uh, infectious disorders. Her PCR was, was negative for herpes simplex virus, and this is her EEG, and uh, so this is a very nice example of uh, bilateral independent sharp waves in the temporal lobes. And I had an MRI scan, and um, what, it, what this one shows is abnormal flare intense signals in the mesial temporal lobes. And I just show this slide to, to point out that um, that it's really nice if you can get your radiologist, if you're thinking about an, a, a, or mesial, a limbic encephalitis, uh, to get a coronal flare image. And they don't always, this isn't a common set of images in, in standard MRIs, but if you're getting an uh, MRI with an epilepsy or dementia protocol, you'll get it. And what you can see is a flare signal all around the mesial temporal lobe involving the uh, amygdala and hippocampal structures. And this is the same patient, but um, on the axial flare image, uh, it's also there, bilateral mesial temporal uh, flare abnormalities, but not quite as dramatic, and sometimes radiologists will not appreciate or will consider that to be an artifact because it sits on the axial images near uh, bony structures. So additionally, uh, she had a perineoplastic antibody testing, which uh, was positive for the antineural nuclear antibody type 1 or the anti hue antibody, and uh, so that leads us already to the diagnosis that hopefully all, all of you are suspecting of a perineoplastic lung cancer-related limbic encephalitis. Patients who are positive for the ANA1 antibody uh, have about a 80% likelihood of having a small cell, usually lung cancer, present. And so uh, the next set of, image, uh, of studies was a chest X-ray and a CT of the body, which was normal. Okay, so now we have a diagnosis, but we haven't found the cancer. And so uh, uh, in this case, we went on to a uh, uh, FDG PET scan which demonstrated hypermetabolic foci along the mediastinal lymph node chain right here, um, and a biopsy of those showed small cell lung cancer. So this is perineoplastic limbic encephalitis, and classically has uh, three features, uh, which of course overlap with some of the other, I get a lot of echo here, uh, overlaps with a lot of the um, other disorders you're hearing about this afternoon. So short-term memory loss, which then progresses to dementia involving uh, more diffuse cognitive difficulties, often personality changes, which can include um, some psychotic, delusional, hallucination features, and then temporal lobe seizures, uh, usually complex partial seizures, but they can secondarily generalize. And there's even been cases of non-convulsive status or epilepsia partialis continua in perineoplastic encephalitis. In my experience, sometimes these complex partial seizures can be subtle um, if they are behavioral changes, and remember these are patients who've had a behavioral change, and sometimes it's uh, the family and others don't appreciate that they're also having spells of um, lapses of, um, of attention and so on. 
One feature of the perineoplastic encephalitis that uh, should point you in that direction is that there's often a multifocal neurologic disorder. And in particular with the anti-HU antibody, uh, there can be uh, effects on other parts of the nervous system, uh, particularly sensory neuropathy or neuronopathy uh, with loss of sensation, sensory ataxia. Uh, a lot of many patients have dysautonomia, in particular GI, uh, dysautonomia gastroparesis, which can present as uh, nausea, uh, and then even uh, cerebellar ataxia, uh, and then constitutional symptoms, of course, and people who harbor a occult malignancy can include weight loss and malaise and so on. So in perineoplastic limbic encephalitis, in, in proven cases, uh, one series uh, that we did showed that about 65 or 70 percent of patients have one or more perineoplastic antibodies, and that's useful for making the diagnosis, but it, be, it means that uh, 30 percent or more of patients don't have a perineoplastic antibody, and so uh, we don't use the antibody panel to rule out the diagnosis, uh, like many of you have heard. The sensitivity is not high enough. So if this clinical suspicion is high, a patient has a, a can cancer risk factors in the right clinical setting, then pursuing a, uh, an aggressive workup for malignancy is appropriate. There's a number of antibodies associated with perineoplastic limbic encephalitis, the classic one being the anti hu antibody, also known as antineuronal nuclear antibody type 1. Um, the important thing about these different antibodies is that although they can be associated with a similar clinical presentation, the antibody may help point you toward the, the, the particular malignancy that's uh, at play here. And so getting a panel of antibodies, this is one time when that may be a useful thing to do. So the uh, ANNA1 or anti hu antibody, as I mentioned, is associated with small cell malignancy, usually small cell lung uh, carcinoma, uh, but there's other sort of rare uh, small cell malignancies that can occur in other places. The anti-MA antibody uh, is associated with limbic encephalitis in younger men with testicular cancer, but otherwise the limbic encephalitis can look very similar. Uh, there's also rare, rarer antibodies such as uh, antineural antibody type 3 or Purkinje cell antibody type 2, which are also associated with small cell lung cancer. Anti-amphiphysin, which we classically associated with, per with perineoplastic stiff person syndrome or uh, progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity, but can be associated with limbic encephalitis as well. Uh, and, and also the CRIP5, also known as anti-CV2 antibody. This antibody has been associated with both small cell lung cancer and thymoma, and many different presentations which can include limbic encephalitis. Uh, calcium channel antibodies sometimes, and then I put NMDA receptor antibodies here, which don't typically cause a classic limbic encephalitis as I've described it, and we'll come back to that disorder, but it is uh, a potentially a perineoplastic antibody. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the classic features are uh, you make the diagnosis by seeing the classic limbic changes on the MRI scan. And I, we mentioned limbic because it's not only the mesial temporal lobe, but you can also see flare signal abnormalities in the insular cortex and cingulate gyrus on, on occasion. But typically, an asymmetric involvement in the mesial temporal lobes is, is the classic thing. But it can look very similar to herpes encephalitis uh, or other disorders. I think I'm getting a lot of feedback. If you, I think I am. Um, the, this, the EEG is often abnormal. Uh, that's probably the most sensitive test, although it's nonspecific. Uh, but it can show uh, epileptiform changes or at least slowing, uh, affecting the mesial temporal lobes. And then the CSF, although it can be normal, most often shows mild inflammatory changes. Um, not characteristic, but a uh, little bit of elevated protein, uh, a mild lymphocytic pleocytosis. As you've heard before, you can see elevations of 14.33 or NSE in these disorders because you have an, a, a destructive attack going on in the brain, so neurons are dying and releasing those proteins. Um, but not, uh, that's not uh, common. And you can also see things such as oligoclonal bands because you have uh, intrathecal antibody production as well. So the cancers to think about, as I mentioned, small cell lung cancer with the anti hu antibody, testicular cancer with anti ma 2 but breast cancer, thymoma, and other things, other, other sorts of malignancies. So you have to cast your net a bit wider. In terms of treatment, once you make the diagnosis, the most important thing is to identify and treat the malignancy. Patients tend not to get better if they have an occult malignancy hanging around. And if it's not found on the first uh, set of uh, investigations, it's worthwhile to, particularly in patients with antibodies or with uh, cancer risk factors, is to repeat the investigation in, in three months uh, again, or to consult with your oncologist to get some advice. 
Um, High-dose steroids are sometimes useful uh, to uh, ameliorate some of the symptoms, but again, if there's still um, a tumor going on, uh, you often don't get much of a response. And then you can move on to plasma exchange and, and other therapies, although uh, there's no real data to, to indicate what's the right course of action in, in the perineoplastic forms. Untreated, uh, this has a bad outcome. Eventually, patients develop mesial temporal atrophy, cognitive impairment, intractable seizures, and, and so on. And so here's an example of a lady that came to see me two years after the onset of her symptoms and was untreated. Um, she had a breast cancer, which actually was found and, and, and treated. And then uh, the, the idea came around, well, maybe this breast cancer had something to do with her, with her uh, uh, progressive dementia. But by the time she saw us, this was her scan. So there, there isn't a whole lot of flare signal left a little bit of probably mesial temporal sclerosis and a lot of atrophy. So regardless of treatment, this is someone that's not going to regain normal function and probably will have persistent problems with seizures. One other point um, I didn't mention earlier, but most of the time you don't see much contrast enhancement uh, with these signal changes and certainly not after two years. So as I, as I said, uh, you can test for all the available perineoplastic antibodies and the list of, of potential antibodies is growing all the time. Uh, but, and we're getting better sensitivity with, with more antibodies, but the sensitivity is still uh, not very good, certainly not 100%. So you need to remain suspicious uh, even if the antibody tests come back normal. Uh, and the cancer is not always found on the initial presentation, so it may require uh, first a PET scan. Uh, and there's been a number of publications now showing that a PET scan, uh, a body PET scan, is more sensitive than CT for detecting malignancy early in patients with perineoplastic disorders. The cases that are particularly uh, appropriate for PET scanning are those with a, a perineoplastic antibody with known cancer associations, as well as patients who have um, a, a characteristic uh, perineoplastic syndrome. Uh, reimbursement is always important, and uh, it's important to note that a PET scan of the body is really only approved, the only approved indications for evaluation of indeterminate lesions. So. Um, it's important to have your radiologist look at this CT very closely and see if they can find anything that's indeterminate so that a uh, PET scan can be done. Um, in many cases, we can get approval for a PET scan based on the fact that they have positive antibodies and so on, but usually that requires an appeal. Um, so immunosuppression can be helpful in some cases. There's been a number of small clinical trials using things like cyclophosphamide, plasma exchange, or other immunosuppressants. Um, but even uh, those responses uh, tend to be incomplete and patients are often left with some degree of deficits. But they can stabilize. Okay, so we'll move on to, to case number two. So this is a 62-year-old man. He's a non-smoker. And over a few weeks, uh, he developed cognitive impairment. So it's a rapidly progressive cognitive problem. He was getting lost in familiar places, couldn't manage his checkbook, had trouble recognizing his friends. He began to have spells where he would have a behavioral arrest and would feel very sweaty. Um, otherwise, he looked well and alert. On his exam, he had marked short-term memory loss, but the remainder of his neurologic exam was normal. So in every sense, this is very similar to the first case I presented, except that he hasn't lost weight and doesn't have those sort of other um, cancer risk factors. So here's his MRI scan, and again, the, the flare coronal MRI shows pretty significant bilateral mesial temporal uh, abnormalities, high signal without contrast enhancement uh, in the region of the hippocampal formation. Um, and his EEG showed generalized slowing with some temporal sharp waves, much like the, the before. His CSF hour is normal. Other laboratory tests were normal except that his serum sodium uh, was low, 125. Uh, the perineoplastic antibodies were negative with the exception that he has voltage-gated potassium channel complex antibodies of quite a high titer. So um, the, depending on which lab you send them to, they can either, either be given as picomoles per liter or nanomoles per liter. That's just a divide by a thousand to get the same one. Um, so his are, are quite elevated. So this is autoimmune limbic encephalitis associated with a voltage-gated potassium channel complex antibody. And in many ways, the clinical presentation is, is similar to perineoplastic limbic encephalitis. So the same sort of time course with cognitive and behavioral changes, short-term memory loss, temporal lobe complex partial seizures, often uh, loss of attention, automatisms. It can be subtle. Uh, MRI and EEG findings can be, can be very similar as well. 
Some of the difference is, um, for whatever reason, uh, these, uh, the potassium channel antibody associated uh, limbic encephalitis has a, a male predominance, uh, which can be as much as two thirds uh, being uh, male. Uh, there's a slight female predominance in perineoplastic disorders. Uh, hyponatremia is often a, a feature that is present at their initial presentation. It's not exactly clear why that happens. We could presume that there's some involvement of hypothalamic structures, perhaps. And they often have um, episodes uh, um, of autonomic hyperactivity, excessive sweating or hypersalivation was reported in the initial uh, descriptions of this disorder. But then more recently, some uh, other characteristic spells, including spells of unusual grimacing or, or apparent uh, dys dystonic spells that I'll show you in just a minute. And I'll show you some video of that because it's, it's so characteristic that you can make the diagnosis just by seeing uh, this, this sort of uh, dystonic spell. So the voltage-gated potassium channel complex uh, uh, disorder is usually not associated with cancer. There are some cases with lung cancer, some cases with thymoma, but that's the minority of cases. So it's worthwhile to consider a perineoplastic cause and, and, and screen the appropriate patients who have cancer risk factors or other uh, constitutional symptoms. These patients usually are steroid responsive, or, or at least they uh, respond to immunotherapy much better than the perineoplastic ones. They can often have a dramatic response to steroids alone, and plasma exchange can be added for more refractory cases. So these uh, spells I mentioned are, are, have been termed facio-brachial dystonic seizures. And uh, in this uh, nice paper by the group at Oxford um, in 2011, uh, they described over 20 cases of patients who had this characteristic um, sort of grimacing, unilateral uh, posturing of the hand. Um, and they, they called them facio-brachial dystonic seizures. I'm not sure. I like that term, but that's what it is. Um, interestingly, they often do not show epileptiform discharges on the EEG. More often, they just show nonspecific slowing. And these spells may not improve with anti-epileptic therapy. So, and they can have many, many of these an hour uh, and be labeled as having status epilepticus. So this is a patient we saw in Dallas recently, and um, he agreed to have his video shown here, um, courtesy of one of my colleagues. And so... I think it's nice to watch it in, in action. So he's here in the EMU getting wired up, and he starts to have this kind of episode. So sometimes the family members describe it as they look startled and anxious, uh, or that um, they look like they're in pain. I have some technical problems here. But um, often, often asymmetric, although in his case he has a little bit of posturing in both hands. Let's see if this video might play again. Yeah. You'll play a little bit better this time in real time. So they're very brief, lasting only a few seconds, but they can happen many, many times an hour. He was having spells about every 15 minutes, uh, but here he had a little flurry of them. You can see kind of the uh, sort of a, uh, surprise, startled look on their face. And patients are really not aware that they're going on. They don't have memory of those episodes. Um, but another patient I saw, the family was very concerned. They seemed to be having episodes of pain. Why are they having this pain? The patient denied he was having episodes of pain. But they look like, oh, they're sort of grimacing. So I want you to remember that picture, even though it didn't play all that well. Um, because uh, the epileptologist in this case called me up and said, we got this guy on three anti-epileptic drugs, and they're just these spells, we just can't stop them. Uh, and once he described them, I said, well, you better check for potassium channel antibodies, and sure enough, he had high levels of antibodies and um, did very well with steroids. So this is a, a, an example of a, another case uh, where uh, treatment with IV methylprednisolone led to a, a dramatic improvement in, in, in the spells and in their cognitive function. Three months later, the patient came back. You can see that the um, mesial temporal changes have improved quite a bit. There may be a little bit of uh, mesial temporal or, or hippocampal atrophy there. Uh, but on exam, the patient looked quite normal, except if you did a uh, cognitive testing, they had some short-term memory deficits. Otherwise normal, and the serum sodium normalizes as well with treatment. So as it turns out, uh, what uh, when we back uh, in the early 2000s, we reported voltage-gated potassium channel antibodies, uh, there was a bit of a, con uh, of a conundrum because these antibodies, voltage-gated potassium channel antibodies, were also found in peripheral disorders, including Isaac syndrome or neuromyotonia. Uh, so how could one antibody cause a peripheral hyperexcitability syndrome as well as limbic encephalitis? 
Um, and so the, the dust kind of cleared a few years ago uh, when a couple of groups found out that most of the voltage-gated potassium channel complex antibodies do not actually bind to potassium channels, but, but bind to associated proteins. And in the case of limbic encephalitis, the predominant antigen that these antibodies bind to is a, a protein called LGI1, or leucine-rich glioma inactivated protein 1. Uh, LGI1 is interesting because it is, it's associated with potassium channels. It also helps to organize the structure of glutamatergic synapses in the hippocampus and, and other places. So uh, antibodies against LGI1 would preferentially you know, target these uh, areas of the brain. And indeed, if you take sections of brain and put the antibodies from these patients there, they'll bind very, very strongly to the hippocampal structures as well. So um, that kind of explains it. So even though the, the assay is called a potassium channel assay, it actually looks for antibodies that either bind to potassium channels or any of the associated proteins. There's other associated antigens, such as Casper 2 which is the usual antigen found in patients with uh, peripheral hyper neuromuscular hyperexcitability, uh, and as well as some other antigens as well. So it's probably more correct to say these patients have LGI1 antibody-associated limbic encephalitis. And some labs can now, uh, once they find a positive antibody in the potassium channel screening assay, they can go on to characterize the antibody as being LGI1 or something else. One of the other uh, recently uh, described antibodies is the DPPX antibody, uh, which I mentioned here because it's a potassium channel antibody. DPPX is actually a re the regulatory subunit of the KV4.2 potassium channel. Um, these antibodies are typically found in patients who have pro a progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus. So they can be uh, confused, uh, have some symptoms that mimic a rapidly progressive dementia, but also have extreme muscle rigidity uh, and can have myoclonus, which is a little bit different than the classic stiff person syndrome, which typically doesn't have so much um, cognitive changes. Um, the DPP DPPX antibodies are not detected in the standard voltage-gated potassium channel antibody, and I expect that this uh, antibody will uh, become available uh, in the future. So uh, I bring it up here because in the, in, the, in the larger series, these are from Mayo Clinic, many of these patients did have memory and behavioral changes, but they also had brain stem, cerebellar signs, myoclonus, weight loss was very prominent. Uh, they could have normal brain MRI scans um, and typically were not associated with cancer, although some patients had lymphoma. So we don't have all the antibodies yet, but I think over time the, the armamentarium of antibody testing is getting more and more. Um, but clinical judgment will still be very important. Okay, case number three. So here's a, a young 24-year-old woman uh, who presented a week of headache with low-grade fevers and then got confused and, and had, a, had a seizure, presented to the hospital, had a temperature of 39. Her CSF showed a lymphocytic pleocytosis and a protein which may be mildly elevated, a normal MRI scan, and an EEG showing diffuse mild slowing. Uh, so because of the the fever and so on. She was started on acyclovir for a concern about herpes simplex encephalitis. Uh, started anticonvulsants, but actually was getting worse, not better. And over the next week or so, developed hallucinations, some homicidal ideation, and then over two more days became rigid and unresponsive, dystonic, uh, with posturing of her arm. And it was noted that she had continuous chewing movements, uh, and then had started to have some hypoxia and trouble breathing, and got intubated. So hopefully everyone knows what this is. So diagnostic studies, her perineoplastic antibodies at the time when she presented were negative. Uh, so were the potassium channel complex antibodies. Um, she had a CT of the pelvis, which showed a calcified cystic lesion in the, around the, near the left ovary, which was resected and turned out to be an immature ovarian teratoma. Uh, she got IV steroids, didn't get a whole lot better, went on to plasma exchange, followed by IVIG, and then cytoxin. She stayed in the ICU a long time, but eventually started to improve and actually, uh, over the course of time, got back pretty close to normal. But that, she spent months in the hospital. So the diagnosis, of course, is NMDA receptor encephalitis. This was the original uh, report by uh, Dalmau and his colleagues in 2007, which reported a number of young women with ovarian teratomas who presented this very characteristic um, uh, rapidly progressive encephalopathy, um, oftentimes with some uh, hyperkinetic movement disorder, dystonia, or oral facial dyskinesias, uh, as well as a lot of psychiatric features. 
So typically, young women with psychiatric symptoms, progressive memory loss, can have seizures, but not always, uh, and can have these dyskinesias, dystonia, uh, orofacial dyskinesias, sometimes myoclonus or rigidity. They often have dysautonomia, uh, labile blood pressure and heart rate, as well as a central sort of hypoventilation system. They often have some pleocytosis. Um, the MRI can be normal in, in half the cases, which makes it challenging. The tip, a typical limbic changes, like I showed you in the previous cases, are unusual, but can occur in about 20 or 25 percent of cases. And we used to think that these were all young women with ovarian teratomas, uh, and indeed, um, young women who present, 60 percent of them will have that. Uh, but we now recognize that this disorder can occur in children and in older people, including uh, men, and those are the groups that generally don't have malignancy. So the antibodies are against the NMDA receptor uh, specific um, uh, types, and the important point is that it's been become very clear that testing for serum NMDA receptor antibodies can be useful, but it can be low in sensitivity, and really the, the more sensitive test is to look for these antibodies in the CSF, and really that, that's the re requirement. If you're thinking about the diagnosis, you really need CSF and MDA receptor antibodies. Um, so the classic presentation is, uh, is often in, in stages, far starting off with sort of nonspecific fever and malaise, pro pro progressing most often to uh, psychiatric symptoms and psychosis. And remember, these are young people who oftentimes get diagnosed with a, with a schizo first schizophrenic episode. Uh, they develop then apathy, memory loss, Two of the patients I've seen pro pro progress to sort of a, uh, a mutism. They just sort of sit there and um, don't say anything. Uh, then they can develop dyskinesias, um, which you really need to look for because that can be the, the main clue. And then they can de decline further from there. Um, if you don't get on them soon enough, they'll end up in the ICU. Outcome can be excellent. And in larger series, uh, the idea is that 75% of them will recover with treatment, which could include tumor resection. Actually, the, the young women with ovarian teratomas tend to do the best once their tumor is resected and they get immunotherapy. Um, those without cancer tend to require more aggressive immunotherapy, have a longer course of recovery. The median hospitalization time uh, from most series is two and a half months. So this is a long process. Families need to know that they don't, unlike some of the, uh, for example, the potassium channel complex associated encephalitis where they can have a dramatic, quick recovery. These don't recover quickly. But many will have a good outcome, and I've seen many folks back a year later who are essentially normal going about their business. <coughs> so here's a video. So this is a, a young lady that was at our uh, intensive care unit. Hopefully this video will work a little bit better. Um, so in the ICU, obviously, and I just draw your attention to the uh, sort of continuous chewing movements. This is a, a young woman who's not very responsive. Um, the, uh, gosh, I'll tell you what, technical issues here. But, um, and the ICU doctors will complain that they chew through the ET tube and they need to be sedated to prevent that from happening. Um, we've seen that a number of times. So if you go to the ICU to see someone who's uh, encephalopathic and has a rapidly progressive dementia, you see this, these chewing movements um, that can be a clue as well. So this was a large, very nice series in Lancet Neurology uh, a few years ago, where the, the group, including uh, Dr. Dalmau, had reviewed all the cases that they could lay their hands on, which is quite a large number, considering this was a disease that was really only described uh, eight years ago for the first time. Um, so we're, now that we know to look for it, we see many, many cases. So a few things came out of that series. One is that uh, the median age is young, and um, that a third of the patients or more are children, meaning um, you know, under, under 15 or 16. So you're, if you're a pediatric neurologist out there, you need to know about this syndrome, which can present a little bit differently in, in the kids. They can often present with irritability and, um, uh, and, and sort of be inconsolable and, and have spells, which are, may not be initially recognized as seizures. Uh, so you have to have your antenna up um, because those uh, can be MDA receptor and, uh, antibody disorder uh, presentations, they typically don't have cancer. Um, but the age range is quite broad, right? Eight months to 85 years old in their series. That's, that's basically everybody. Um, of, the, of the women, uh, about half of them have a tumor, usually an ovarian teratoma, sometimes a dermoid, but I, pathologists probably say that there's not much difference there. Um, in males and in kids, the tumor risk is very small. Uh, this disorder seems to be a little bit more common in uh, the African-Americans and Asians, 
uh, compared to white and Hispanics um, as far as the whole group. Uh, usually the, the CSF is abnormal, but only abnormal in about 80%. So there are some that have a normal CSF, as in the case I presented, uh, and the MRIs I, I mentioned. So CSF is really, CSF NMDA receptor antibody is the, the, is the test of choice, and that is now available uh, commercially. 81% uh, of patients in the series that, that was reported responded to treatment. Um, so the first line treatment, typically tumor removal, steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange, about half of the patients will get a response, which means that half of them have to go on to more aggressive therapy, uh, which can typically involves either rituximab or cyclophosphamide. Again, this is off-label stuff. Um, there's, has up to now and has been no clinical trial uh, of these therapies. Fortunately, uh, if you have to move on to second-line therapy, that's effective uh, in, a, in many of the, of the folks. Um, if you don't treat them, this is a serious disease and patients do die of an MDA receptor uh, antibody encephalitis. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, some of the cases have now been shown to have a viral uh, trigger. Uh, so if you, if you look, there may be evidence or even a history of uh, a preceding uh, viral encephalitis and herpes simplex has been implicated in some cases, uh, but many times you can't identify a particular trigger. Um, most patients get better, but there are, uh, and, and stay better, but about 12% are, we think now may have a relapse. And if, we've also encountered some young people who present uh, and get diagnosed for the first time, but if you go back in their history, they may have had a, a, a sort of similar sort of encephalopathic presentation in childhood that no one could really figure out and they got better. Uh, of course, we don't know whether that was NMDA receptor encephalitis, but it's a suspicious sort of history. So um, the area in terms of autoimmune encephalopathies that's really growing is the area of ion channel antibodies. Uh, so in addition to the Volgicated potassium channel complex antibodies and the NMDA receptor antibody, we now know that there can be perineoplastic uh, or autoimmune encephalitides that are associated with other uh, neuronal uh, uh, neuronal uh, membrane protein antibodies. Um, and some of the more recent ones um, that are, are now being recognized more often are antibodies either against AMPA glutamate receptors or GABA receptors. Uh, GABA B receptors, or as we learned just in the past year, GABA A receptors can also be a target of antibodies. Most of these are very similar to the perineoplastic limbic encephalitis cases I mentioned with the mesial temporal lobe changes and the complex partial seizures uh, and uh, rapidly progressive uh, cognitive impairment, um, and it's thought that as time goes by, we're now finding what many of those zero, quote unquote, zero negative perineoplastic cases may actually have antibodies. Uh, so the list of available antibodies will be growing, and that will help us in making our diagnoses. Most of these other uh, perineoplastic, most of these other antibodies against membrane protein uh, antigens are are perineoplastic. Small cell lung cancer, breast carcinoma can can be seen in those cases. Um, and there's some subtle differences in the presentation, which are probably not all that helpful in an individual case. But in larger series, the AMPA receptor patients tend to be, have a more psychiatric presentation, and the GABA B receptor patients with presenting with new onset intractable uh, uh, epilepsy. So here's just a quick summary of, the, of those things. So uh, the NMJ receptor antibody is unique in that the age of onset is, is much younger. So this is the one we're thinking about in younger folks whereas these are, are typically middle-aged uh, middle people. Uh, the LGI-1 antibody encephalitis is, is interesting because of the male predominance, which is different than the others, um, and the hyponatremia. Uh, but these are all, um, uh, and, and the NMDA receptor antibody may be associated with normal MRI scan. Okay, so moving on, uh, case number four. This is a 40-year-old woman who has uh, had a complaint of headache and was later found to be confused sitting at her desk. So she went to the hospital. Uh, she seemed to be improving, so they sent her home. But later, she was complaining of some additional confusion, and I was having some muscle jerkiness and tremor, and was continuing to have these episodes where she was disoriented and having trouble speaking. So she came in again. Her brain MRI scan, including diffusion imaging, was normal. But she continued to have odd behavior, um, and so she got admitted to the psychiatric unit. Uh, they did a workup, so her CSF protein was a little bit high, but, but uh, no pleocytosis. All the antibody tests were negative, except that she did have a positive thyroperoxidase antibody, even though she was not hypothyroid, had no history of that. Um, so she, a diagnosis was considered, and she was treated with IV methylprednisolone, and her symptoms got dramatically better. So she went back to work, 
had no further relapses. Uh, several months later, in, in evaluate, while she was being evaluated, she had developed hypothyroidism. So what's the diagnosis? Well, this is a steroid responsive encephalopathy with thyroid antibodies. It's a very descriptive name. Um, most people like to call this Hashimoto encephalopathy, although that uh, term is um, you know, somewhat disfavored by people in the field. Um, first described actually in 1966 by our friend Lord Brain. Um, this is a sort of enigmatic uh, disorder because it has a lot of different clinical presentations, but the common presentation is a fluctuating cognitive and behavioral syndrome, uh, episodes of confusion, as well as episodes of aphasia. That's pretty typical and even has been described as having stroke-like events, so sometimes brief, ep brief episodes of TIAs or uh, with things like vision loss or uh, hemiparesis or word-finding difficulties. They often have a lot of tremor and may even have myoclonus, which makes one think about uh, Creutzfeldt disease as, or CJD. So unfortunately, there's no clear diagnostic criteria because thyroid antibodies are very common. Uh, many normal people have them. Of course, many, many people with hypothyroidism have thyroid antibodies, and that's not a specific finding. It's useful if your patient with a rapidly progressive dementia has thyroid antibodies and is also euthyroid, indicating that they don't have a long-standing uh, autoimmune thyroiditis. The response to thero steroids is, is key. Of course, you can't have a steroid-responsive encephalopathy unless they respond to steroids. Um, and you need to rule out other diagnoses, especially the other things we're talking about today, especially if they don't respond to steroids, you're, you're thinking about doing something else. Um, overall, the CSF uh, can be abnormal in 75% of cases, nonspecific findings like an elevated protein or occasionally uh, some mild lymphocytic pleocytosis. Uh, in the series from Mayo, about half the patients had a mild elevation of transaminases. Not, not sure why that, that happens, but it can be a useful sign. Uh, EG can be normal, can be slowed, sometimes shows epileptiform discharges, not very helpful. MRI scan, often normal. And when it's abnormal, there can be a number of different uh, uh, presentations. So some patients show it's kind of this diffuse, hazy white matter abnormality that gets better with steroids, so probably related to the, to the syndrome. And occasionally, there's been patients reported who have uh, dural enhancement uh, after contrast, which can improve. So um, again, not, not specific, but some, at least there's an, an MRI correlate. Uh, some patients have been biopsied. Uh, again, nothing specific found. So. This is a really a tough one, but, but it's, it's here because it's a treatable form of, uh, of a rapidly progressive change in behavior and cognition uh, that we can consider. As I mentioned, the clinical presentation is varied. The, co the core feature is the, is the fluctuations of, the, uh, of cognitive and behavioral changes. I find tremor to be useful, so a new tremor, usually sort of a, a postural high-frequency tremor is what you see and episodes of aphasia, that, that's uh, sort of suggestive as well. Uh, many, two-thirds have myoclonus or ataxia. Seizures, not in everybody, but occasionally seizures can, be, can play a role. Uh, sleep disorders and headache, um, again, not very specific, but we're commonly seen in these folks. So what to do? Well, of course, again, not, there's been no treatment trials for the steroid responsive encephal encephalopathies, but um, steroids would be the first uh, course of action. And then in, par in patients who relapse after you've stopped the steroids, then consideration of steroid sparing agents. Uh, there's been um, use of other agents in resistant cases as well. Okay, uh, case five, just for uh, interest, a 35-year-old man. He's developed burning pain and paresthesias, and then leg cramps and muscle twitching all over, uh, nuance at hypertension, excessive sweating, erectile dysfunction, and a really a major problem with sleeping. Uh, sleepy during the day, but no sleeping at night, uh, and has spells of disorientation and hallucinations. So on his exam, he has a uh, fluctuating mental status. His orientation and alertness fluctuates. He's having some visual hallucinations, uh, fasciculations all over the place, uh, some myoclonic jerking, and spells of intense sweating. Otherwise, everything was normal. Um, his EG showed some slowing, again, nonspecific. When he had his nerve, con he had some nerve conduction studies which showed this finding. So this is the, uh, the gain is turned up to show that after his initial CMAP, he has a number of repetitive after discharges. And his EMG was abnormal, showing fasciculations and neuromyotonic discharges. The brain MRI scan is normal. So we went for polysomnography. Uh, I think probably Dr. Bobet did his polysomnography. It's a Mayo case. Um, and so for several days, he had complete absence of sleep, no sleep complexes at all. Um, 
and he was basically talking and moving around throughout the night. So there's a little quick video of what he looks like. And I divulged that this is Morvan syndrome. Um, so here's his calf, which is just very active. Lots of fasciculations and twitching, and you might appreciate that his skin is damp. He's very sweaty. And I bring up this case also to remind you that when you see someone with a rapidly progressive dementia, you're suspecting an autoimmune cause. It can be worthwhile to, of course, ask about sleep, uh, but also look at the muscles because some of the, these disorders related to potassium channel antibodies can have um, fasciculations and hyperactive uh, muscles. So the last video there was him at night, just sort of uh, misbehaving and hallucinating and so on. So this is Morvan syndrome. Uh, it's here mainly for historical reasons because this is exceedingly rare, although occasionally run into a case. It's, it's a combination of neuromyotonia with a rapidly progressive encephalopathy, prominent insomnia, and dysautonomia. Uh, in this case, uh, usually labile blood pressure and heart rate and, and so on. So this gentleman had uh, voltage-gated potassium channel antibodies, which were positive. He had a thymoma, which was resected. It was a, you know, sort of quote-unquote benign thymoma. And after his thymectomy was treated with plasma exchange, followed by IVIG, he had a few courses of uh, cyclophosphamide, but then was eventually able to come off all of his immunosuppressant medications and had a complete recovery for at least the next 10 years that I was able to follow him. This was described in 1870 by Augustine de Morvan. So again, historically, this may be uh, one of the first uh, rapidly progressive uh, autoimmune encephalopathies. Um, and he described nerve hyperexcitability, dysautonomia, insomnia, fluctuating mental status. Um, we know now that most of these patients have a normal brain MRI scan, which differentiate them from the LGI-1 uh, associated uh, encephalitis. And most of these patients have voltage-gated potassium channel complex antibodies, which turn out to be of the CASPER-2 type. CASPER-2 is a uh, protein that anchors the voltage-gated potassium channels uh, in, the, in the axon membranes. Many patients have thymomas. You need to look for that. Yeah, um, it's. I don't know the answer to that, but because Casper two is thought to be a myelinated nerve and not um, and not centrally, but uh, it's clearly more complicated than just uh, antibodies against one protein. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, in summary, so an, an autoimmune encephalopathy needs to be in the differential uh, of a cause of rapidly progressive cognitive impairment. Why? Because it's potentially treatable, and these things may actually be more common than we, than we thought 13 years ago when we started this course. We've learned about a lot more uh, of disorders. So you need to have the clinical suspicion, of course, before you can make the diagnosis and order the right laboratory tests. To differentiate from other causes, uh, CSF, uh, uh, as you've heard, is very important. Looking at the MRI carefully yourself, looking for changes uh, in the mesial temporal lobes uh, or for changes that look more like CJD. Um, and then EEG can be helpful. So uh, EEG abnormalities can help localize the problem. And our <laughs> there are some diagnostic EEG uh, findings as well. So characteristic of autoimmune encephalopathies can be uh, some clinical fluctuations. Seizures are common, which are not common in some of the degenerative uh, uh, or infectious causes. Uh, and then look for associated findings, which can include neuropathy in the case of perineoplastic syndromes or, a, or neuromuscular hyperexcitability with muscle twitching uh, in some of the potassium channel associated disorders. And then the antibody studies uh, are very important because they can help narrow the diagnosis, uh, but they're not perfect. The sensitivity is not 100%, and there can be even some troubles with specificity. So the voltage-gated potassium channel complex antibody assay is not perfect. There's probably a few percent of false positives in that assay, particularly at low titers. Uh, so if you get a positive, uh, and you're not certain about the diagnosis, it can be helpful to subtype those antibodies and to find out if they do, in, in fact, have LGI-1 antibodies as well. And, of course, TPO antibodies, not specific at all, uh, and need to be uh, interpreted with, with a lot of caution. Um, and, and, unfortunately, newer serological studies are becoming available. Uh, for example, NMDA receptor antibodies are now much easier to come by. Should you use an empiric trial of high-dose steroids when you have the, when you have the suspicion um, and that's a, still, a, after many years of thinking about this, is still a topic of, of some debate. But um, I think our approach has been that if someone has a rapidly progressive dementia and is not clearly falling into a degenerative or CJD pattern, uh, and you've ruled out infection and lymphoma, then uh, a course of high dose steroids can help clear the air because if they respond dramatically, you can at least label them as having a steroid responsive encephalopathy. 
And I always uh, remind my colleagues and, and my patients that we're not looking for the high of steroids that people get while they're taking steroids, but in fact, a sustained benefit in terms of their encephalopathy that lasts at least for uh, a week or so. So uh, just to finish up, this is our experience one of our residents has looked at recently um, of cases of, uh, of autoimmune encephalopathy uh, diagnosed at our center in the past uh, six years. And we, he, he was able to find 68 cases. That's probably an underestimate because it depends on how they were coded in, in the medical record. But that's still quite a few. That's about one a month. Um, and it's interesting that, um, that uh, 20 of the cases, or about a third, no antibody was identified. And they were defined as having a immunoresponsive limbic encephalitis in most cases. So they looked like they had limbic encephalitis. They had no cancer, um, no perineoplastic antibodies, and they responded. Uh, so about a quarter of them ended up did having uh, cancer at some point, but no antibody. Uh, another third had NMDA receptor antibodies. So that among the antibodies turn, is becoming the most common one you will find. More than half of those were in kids. The median age of the whole group was only 15 years old. So about half the cases are from the pediatric hospital, the other half from the adults. Um, half of them had normal MRI scan as seen in the previous studies. Voltage-gated potassium channel complex antibodies were next most common, again, the male predominance, typical limbic features. Um, in our series, 40% um, of them had cancer. Usually these were thymomas, but other cancers as well. So nine patients who were diagnosed as having quote-unquote Hashimoto encephalopathy, uh, were typical sort of cases responded to steroids. Interestingly, we've had six patients whose only antibody marker was positive GAD65 antibodies, but presenting more with a sort of limbic, rapidly progressive dementia case, and I think we're recognizing that association, although, of course, GAD65 is typically associated with limbic encephalitis. We now know that it, it can be associated with intractable epilepsy or an encephalopathy type of picture. Uh, and then three patients with GABA-B receptors, so this does, we do find this one. And interestingly enough, although the first case I talked about was perineoplastic limbic encephalitis, of, of our series, only one patient over the last couple of years who presented with the classic anti-HU uh, antibody associate. Although, so that, although that's the classic one, we now recognize that these other newer, more newly recognized antibodies are actually much more common in our clinical practice, uh, and these patients may be overall more common than we used to think. So I'll, with that, I'm done. I'll just leave this slide up here, which summarizes all the different disorders that I talked about. I think we're about on time. So if I can say, yeah, we can take maybe one or two questions and then we'll move on. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know. Of course, the, the hippocampus and the amygdala are, are different, right? They're different than the other parts of the brain. Uh, they have different antigens. Uh, the, the structure is different. Um, it's interesting that also many of the viral encephalitis go there, too. Um, maybe Al has a comment on, on why we think that's the case. Oh, he doesn't know why. Okay, so he's not going to answer the question. So why do these affect the mesial temporal lobes predominantly? Uh, I don't think we know, but it's, it's clearly uh, true. I was just going to make a quick comment, yeah. Steve, on the, on the idea of limbic encephalitis. Um, I just want to call the audience's attention. There's another infectious disorder that I haven't meant, didn't mention in my talk, but talked about earlier this week. It's called HHV6, and it's more specifically in the context of patients who have hemopoietic stem cell transplant. It's usually in the post-transplant period, usually about three weeks after the transplant on average, but it has a particular look like your limbic encephalitis cases where there's bilateral temporal lobe, uh, mesial temporal, hippocampal increased signal, and it, again, the HHV6 uh, is positive in the CSF in those circumstances. It can be particularly challenging because the patients are often very sick, but they pre present with an amnestic syndrome, sometimes with partial complex seizures. I think your point is that it can be a little bit less acute than the typical HSV1 encephalitis. Right, right. They don't look like HV, H, HSV1 type encephalitis. They look more like Olympic encephalitis associated with perineoplastic antibodies just on the, on the temporal profile and the, and the clinical profile of those patients. So just to raise awareness to that. The question down here, did you have? Yeah. 
Uh, well, I, I, don't, I can't give you a definite answer, but uh, if you're asking for my personal approach, I, I typically will use a steroid sparing, a little bit of steroids, steroid sparing agent that hopefully taper off the steroids. Uh, so oral mycophenolate, Celsept, and uh, azathioprine. Um, I have used on occasion some rituximab, usually the NMDA receptor ones. Um, and, but you know, if you have a favorite steroid sparing agent, I can't say that it's wrong. The idea is that you could probably manage them on moderate dose steroids for a long time, but then you're going to run into a lot of steroid problems. So I have some epidemiological questions. So what's the prevalence of these paraneoplastic antibodies in the general population? And in their respective cancers, what's their frequency in each uh, cancer? And uh, so what's the frequency of not finding a cancer? With this. Okay, so I think your question is how often will you find a perineoplastic antibody in the normal healthy control population? So as I mentioned, the potassium channel antibody complex it does have a false positive rate of a couple of percent. It's not very high, but it's there. You, the, uh, presumably the anti-HU antibody do, uh, doesn't have a, I mean, those are abnormal. But now there are patients who have uh, anti-HU antibodies who do, you never find cancer. And the question always comes up is did they have cancer and you did, never found it? Or, uh, or perhaps the immune system eradicated it before you could find it? Or do they really never have a cancer? And there's some, we've seen a few patients with ANA1 antibodies in you know, 10 year olds and um, they probably don't have cancer. So uh, I think you gotta look, look in the context, but much more likely that those antibodies directed against nuclear and cytoplasmic antibodies like anti-HU are, are much more likely to be specific than the ones directed against membrane protein antibodies where the, where the incidence of cancer is much lower. There's still an, a, a very important autoimmune marker, but the, but the, the prediction of cancer is, is less in general. Yeah, so in looking at your, your summary slide, uh, I note that the usual age goes into the 70s and 80s uh, from uh, just, I guess, just about all of these. And it's common in my experience that the family brings the patient in and they say, oh, you know, it started, you know, three months ago or, or something like that. And so the question is, uh, you know, in your, in your opinion, let's say, you know, there isn't any red flags, but the family says, you know, it's going on for three months, the patient is, you know, 68 years old. How often, uh, you know, do you see one of these uh, autoimmune syndromes, you know, showing up in what uh, would otherwise sound like a more typical case, or another way to ask the question is, you know, what's the longest uh, duration of sort of a prodrome before they come to medical attention in your experience? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think what uh, Michael said earlier about taking a good history is critical uh, because there are many cases who come in and say, I think this is a rapidly progressive dementia. You start taking the history, no, they've really been declining for two and a half years. Um, in the ones who come later, just because they've not gotten to the right uh, diagnosis soon enough. You st I, I typically will still get the, the idea that their initial presentation was over weeks or, or months, and then they sort of plateaued and they were bad for a while before they um, came to medical attention, as opposed to them gradually worsening uh, in over time. So if you really get a several year history, you're probably going to think in a, in a different direction. But, you know, again, there's some clues abnormal EEGs, seizures, that kind of thing, abnormal CSF that, that, you, that may push you in a different direction. But, but if you have a history of six months and you delve into it, it seems like it sounds like it's really six months, you would definitely work them up for... I think so. Yeah, yeah. That's still in the wrap. I think that's still within our definition of okay. rapidly progressive. Yeah.